So now the main story here is that anytime you have a distributed data uh, that you need for machine learning, let's say, then the data is unavailable because of privacy or trade secrets or regulation. Uh, and so what we can do is we can use privacy preserving algorithms to support machine learning algorithms that have been decentralized. So this is the challenge we have, right? On one hand, uh, we have on this privacy utility access uh, for Google Maps, we willingly give away our location. For health data, uh, we don't give away our health data. So it stays in silos and so we get very little utility. So would there be an equivalent of Google Maps for our health data? If you can see, if you can have a bird's eye view into everything that's going on, you know, you can probably solve some of the most important problems in health uh, overnight, right? And so the goal for privacy preserving machine learning is to have privacy and utility. So let's take a concrete example. Like if, if we had, you know, about 2 million hospitalizations for COVID-19, if we had everybody's chest x-rays, you know, we can very quickly figure out if this person needs in a different kind of a care. But the best data set that's out there for chest x-rays right now only has 14,000 images. You use something called smashing. Uh, and two techniques have emerged in the last few years. One is called federated learning. And the second is called split learning, which is from our group at MIT. So the way you do that is you take a neural network, you split it. The early part of the network executes at the server, sorry, at the client. And the later part of the neural uh, DNN executes at the server. And the early part, we call it the smasher. And the smasher converts your data point into this smashed representation. Uh, and rest of the rest of the process is similar to a traditional uh, TNN process for supervised learning. And the basic idea behind both these techniques is to share wisdom, but not raw data. So if you think about the smartphones, I would just want the wisdom from the smartphones. I don't need to ask raw data, especially personally identifiable data. So coming to exposure notification and contact tracing, the classic method is you want to use smartphones, Bluetooth-based, you know, neighborhood neighborhood calculations. Notify if you're cross path with somebody who was later diagnosed positive. Uh, once you get that notification, ask the person to do some kind of self-assessment and diagnosis, and finally create some public health and coordination tools for, for public health. The challenge is how do you do this in a privacy preserving way, right? Which means that no phone number, no, uh, no name or email address or student ID number or, or things like that should be asked for. So this is a pretty complicated problem. So we spun out a nonprofit uh, out of MIT uh, in April, uh, and we're helping many states and nations launch their apps. Uh, and what we need to do is get to this model where you know um, the data doesn't even get sent to a server in its raw form, right? And if you achieve that, then we have a win-win. You know, it goes back to my first slide on privacy. Versus. And then if you want to do any kind of distributed machine learning, then you have all these challenges with compute, data, bandwidth, you know, machine learning specific issues and so on. Uh, I'll send this slide, so uh, I won't go into the details. Uh, and so the challenge is how do you manage all of these things? And uh, it turns out that using this methodology of converting data into a smash representation becomes, you know, 100 to 1,000 times better. Um, is there a mechanism in the application to identify users for like real high risk versus that one casual pass by example that we gave? You're right that the, the vanilla protocol right now is very simple. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, just calculate how, many, how long were you there, and if it's more than 15 minutes, then send an alert. Uh, you know, too close for too long, that's what they call it. Um, uh, but you're right that, you know, what if you were, uh, so you know, we're all scientists here, um, being close to an infected person for 15 minutes uh, within uh, you know, six feet, is that the same as meeting 15 infected people for one minute each. I think another perspective could be that, um, say you're talking with someone for 15 minutes versus you're meeting 15 different people for one minute each. I think the second case has more risk because uh, statistically out of the 15 people, um, there will be a higher chance of the virus you know, existing than just the one person because you know having one minute of minute should not matter uh, if the person is infected, right? Learning about uh, how different countries and states have responded to COVID, mm -hmm. I feel like all of them essentially had access to all those great technologies that like either tech companies had come up with or research institutions had come up with. Right. But there was just this lack of political will to implement these ideas. Mm -hmm.